today we're going to be looking at the mysterious transmission towers perched atop Kunyane, Mount Wellington in Tasmania, Australia. The towers are a source of fascination and sometimes anger for the community in the city of Hobart that sits nestled under the mountain range. For over 60 years the transmission towers have stood over the city, yet many locals are unaware of their true purpose, often mistaking them for mobile phone towers. Well, in this video, we will delve into the fascinating history of these towers, we'll uncover some secrets of their interior, and explore what the future holds for these iconic structures. The land on which the towers are built is leased by the City Council and managed between several different organisations. The summit has strict regulations placed on it due to its amazing natural values, views and beauty. As the towers reside in one of these protected areas, there are many restrictions on what can be done in this area. There are two current broadcast towers that sit atop the summit of the mountain. A smaller steel lattice tower which is owned by Wind Television, which is around 60 metres high. And the larger, more visual concrete tower, which is owned by Broadcast Australia at 131 metres high. Now, undoubtedly, the towers have served a hugely vital role for the city of Hobart. But what does the public's reaction reveal about the complex relationship between technology, infrastructure and community values? Known as the Postmaster General Tower or PMG Tower, the first tower on the mountain was built in 1959 and owned by the Federal Government's National Transmission Agency or the NTA which brought national television to Tasmania for the first time. It was constructed on the summit of the mountain for very practical reasons. It's the highest point in Hobart, providing the best coverage. But practical doesn't always mean popular. In the 1950s, when the transmission tower was first built, there was little opposition from the community, likely due to the excitement of finally having access to television services in Australia. However, when a proposal was made in the 1990s to upgrade the tower, there was severe public backlash. The original PMG tower had become severely compromised due to the harsh weather conditions, and it was widely assumed that any upgrade would include a merge of all broadcasting transmissions onto a new single tower. However, this didn't take place. The existing Wind TV tower was not part of the plan to be removed because they had already signed a 99 year lease for their site and tower in 1959. And a second tower provides somewhat redundancy for anything that may go wrong. In addition, at the time, the Wind TV broadcast building's location provided a line of sight microwave link back to the studios in the city. This was not possible from the proposed PMG building, so the idea to merge all transmitters was scrapped. After a lengthy bureaucratic process to obtain approval from various entities, planning began in 1991 to replace the ageing PMG tower. In 1994, construction finally commenced, marking a significant milestone in the evolution of the transmission infrastructure. The tower is an impressive engineering feat. It's anchored with 18 rock anchors at various depths between 10 and 15 metres. It consists of a 67 metre concrete shaft and a 64 metre steel superstructure, supporting multiple broadcasting antennas. A fiberglass radome shields the antennas from the weather. Eventually in 1997, after construction was complete, it was time to take down the old tower. This was accomplished by cutting two legs and pushing it over with a hydraulic ram onto the car park. The new transmission tower features a rack and pinion lift that reaches up to the 60 metre mark, with workers having to climb the remaining height to service the equipment. However, the top half of the tower is off limits while broadcasting, and any issues with the antennas require a reduction in power to fix. Workers must also adhere to strict time limits due to high levels of electromagnetic radiation that can pose a risk with prolonged exposure. While these levels are perfectly safe for the public on the ground, they present a different set of challenges for those working in the direct near field of the antennas. A far more dangerous hazard for the public is the potential for ice forming and falling from the tower. 
The slip form concrete design was chosen to help minimise falling ice and the area has since been fenced off. But chunks of ice are still blown off in gusty weather, although to a much lesser extent. The tower also employs tuned liquid dampers, which help to control the tower's movement in extreme winds, having been recorded at sustained speeds of over 157 km per hour, with rare gusts of up to 200 km per hour. The new concrete tower is now infamous for its standout design, with some people referring to it not so affectionately as the tampon in the sky, because of the white sheathing around the top part of the structure. This has constantly drawn the ire of locals and has been criticised for its appearance over the Hobart skyline, being the tallest structure looking down on the city from 1250 metres above sea level. Now inside is where all the action happens, as the tower provides a multitude of broadcasting purposes, with SBS and ABC FM radio on 92.9, 93.9 and 105.7 MHz respectively. Digital television on 177.5 and 191.5 MHz. Digital radio on 202.352 and 202.928 MHz. And a commercial radio services for Triple M 107.3, Hit 100.9, Ultra 106.5 and 7HO FM on 101.7 MHz. Within the building, a remarkable assortment of equipment can be found, including high-power VHF digital NEC television transmitters, each running an impressive 7.5 kilowatts. Additionally, several FM transmitters ranging from 5 to 20 kilowatts of power are fed into large combiners that lead to copper tubes and feeders that run to the top of the towering 131-metre structure, where they connect to Jampro four-sided panel array antennas. Now notably, the VHF TV Band 3 antennas are interleaved with the VHF Band 2 FM radio antennas inside the top of the structure, making for a truly impressive engineering feat. The lower level of the transmission tower serves as space for smaller communication antennas, mainly for Ericsson's EDAC system operating around 850 MHz and the Vodafone mobile phone carrier. Additionally, there are also a range of microwave panel antennas that are used for outside broadcasting uplinking on 2.6 GHz. The building also has many point-to-point -point microwave links, mainly used from the studio in the city to the transmitter site. These are located inside, behind panels that allow RF to penetrate through. This then protects them from the harsh outside weather. Several large dishes located outside are also used to pick up a feed from geostationary satellites should terrestrial links happen to fail. The still lattice structure to the north, owned by the station Wind Television, broadcasts all commercial free-to-air television stations across three digital television channels on 184.625 MHz, 212.5 MHz and 219.5 MHz. It's much less visually intrusive and it often gets forgotten about due to the colour it is painted, a light teal or blue, which assists it to blend in with the sky. Now this tower is, as far as I can research, the original tower that was installed for the station back in 1960. If this is truly the case, it's a real testament to the structural engineers at the time, as the tower has withstood some pretty insane weather, and whilst having many coats of paint, looks remarkably good for its age. In 2001, tragedy struck when a fire broke out in the newly installed digital television transmitters. This caused significant damage amounting to over $4 million. The accident resulted in the station and others sharing the facilities to go off air for several days. Now given the rich history from the mountain spanning many years, it begs the question how do members of the public perceive the impact of these transmission towers in the present day? Well, according to a recent historic heritage assessment, a significant number of people have noted that the towers are visually intrusive and would like to see them removed when there is an alternative technology that means they are not necessary. So has there been enough technological advancement to render them obsolete? The answer is no.
As traditional television and radio broadcasting remains more reliable than internet-based alternatives, it is unlikely that the transmission towers will be dismantled anytime soon. They have become an iconic part of the mountain range and a beautiful sight to behold, although not everyone may agree. Despite any dissenting opinions, the public generally recognises and appreciates the value that these transmitters have provided for over 60 years. If you found this video thought provoking, please consider subscribing to my channel, leaving a like or check out some of my other video content.